Okay, I think that we should start and people will be trickling in. Um, hi everybody, welcome once again to another episode of our series of Discovery Seminar Talks. My name is Miria Montes and I'm a Space Telescope Science Institute postdoctoral fellow and I will be the chair today. The aim of the Discovery Seminars is to showcase uh, the work of postdocs at the, uh, of the Space Telescope uh, Science Institute and John Hopkins community. Early career uh, researchers have been disproportionately affected by the COVID-19 pandemic due to, uh, to reduced travel and networking opportunities. On top of that, we have here at Space Telescope a large community of international postdocs that have been separated from their uh, families and loved ones for a long time. With these talks, uh, what uh, our aim is, um, is we want to provide a platform for these postdocs to show their results to an international audience of astronomers. Um, please, um, at the end of, of the talks, uh, feel free to ask questions by using the uh, raise hand button, or also you can uh, ask in the, in the chat and I will re read them for, uh, for you. So without further ado, I will introduce our first speaker today. Our first speaker is Ayan Acharya. He did his bachelor's and master's at the Indian Institute of Technology, Karakpur in, in India. He then moved to Canberra to pursue a PhD at the Astro uh, Australian National University, where he worked with uh, Lisa Kiely on the chemi chemical evolution in galaxies. In January 2021, he joined uh, John Hopkins as a postdoc in the Foggy Group. Currently, he is studying the distribution of metallicities in simulated foggy galaxies. And today, he's going to talk about um, magic, apparently. So, I am the floor is yours. I am, you are muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Yes, awesome. Great. Um, so yeah, um, happy new afternoon, everyone. Um, again, thanks again, Maria, for the introduction. Uh, as you just heard, I've been here for a little more than a year now. Uh, but today I'm going to talk mostly about some of the work that I did during my PhD uh, with Christoph Fedrath and Mark Krumholz, uh, as well as Lisa Culey. But towards the end of the talk, I will give you a sneak peek of my ongoing work here as a postdoc. Uh, now, as you can see uh, in this very scientific demonstration in the title slide, um, Hermione uses the spell Oculus Reparo to fix Harry's broken glasses. The reason I have it here is because our goal is somewhat similar in the sense that we want to see, we want to try and see the very, very distant galaxies in a better and sharper image. And because we don't have access to magic yet, for now we will try to, um, try to achieve our goal by using mock data cubes instead. And that's why, hence the title, Moculus Repair. Now, I'm sure I don't need to convince this particular audience of the importance of studying the high redshift universe, but given that this talk is being broadcasted to a, a larger audience, I think it's worth giving a very brief motivation. Now, we know that most of the stars formed in the universe around 10 billion years ago, that is around the redshift of two. Now, because star formation plays such a huge role in determining how galaxies grow and evolve, it is important to study this particular epoch of cosmic time, otherwise known as the cosmic noon. However, this epoch is not yet very well understood. It is easier to study the nearby galaxies because of the proximity, but it is more challenging as we keep studying um, galaxies that are farther out. Now, now that we've established that our aim is to study the cosmic noon and beyond, what are some of the challenges? Well, the primary challenge is that the distant universe is distant. And therefore, as a consequence, we see two broad things, or at least two of the consequences, are that it affects what color we see and how well we see. In other words, um, distant, observing distant galaxies um, leads to shifting of the wavelength to farther and farther towards rest frame ultraviolet for a given observed wavelength. And on the other hand, we lose uh, effective spatial resolution as we start observing at a higher um, distance. Um, so what's the, what's the solution? What could be the solution to these? Well, the first problem can be tackled by developing new rest frame ultraviolet diagnostics. And the second problem can be addressed by quantifying the effects of limited spatial resolution by generating synthetic observations. 
It is the second topic that I'm going to talk in, talking about today mostly. Um, so also it's worth mentioning that you know with James Webb now um, having reached its destination and about to start um, observations soon and other large telescopes like the Giant Magellan Telescope underway, it is very timely to do this kind of studies, this kind of build these kind of tools right now which will help us understand um, these upcoming observations much better, right? So in order to understand the effect of the limited spatial resolution, we need to consider the properties that are most affected by this limited spatial resolution. One such property is the gas phase metallicity or the abundance of oxygen in galaxies, which is a way of saying that, you know, how, how spatially distributed is the, are the metals in, in the gas of the galaxy. In terms of specific question that we want to ask today is, how fine a spatial resolution or how sharp an image do we need to observe the actual or the intrinsic metallicity gradient in a galaxy? Now, metallicity gradients are important because depending on what the metallicity gradient value is, we can learn a lot about the galaxy's past. For example, whether it had a merger in the past or um, if, it had, if it saw inside-out star formation and so on. Uh, but even though measuring metallicity gradients accurately is important, uh, we can see that, you know, it might be, I'll show you in a minute that why it might be affected by limited spatial resolution. For example, in this plot, uh, most of the, this shows a collection of observations as well as theoretical studies of metallicity gradient. Most of the observations uh, show a very slight trend towards shallower or flatter metallicity gradient at higher redshifts. Now, how much of this flattening is real? versus how much of it is because of the insufficient spatial resolution as we observe the higher redshifts. To answer that question, or to quantify this, we will basically be producing synthetic data cubes from a simulated galaxy. We made somewhat um, a complicated pipeline to produce realistic data cubes, uh, the details of which I'll spare you in the interest of time, but I'm happy to discuss that later if there is interest. But for now, I'll just quickly go over the key steps in the pipeline. So as I said, essentially we convert a simulated, isolated Milky Way type disk galaxy to a mock 3D data cube. The data cube consists of two spatial dimensions, X and Y, and then the wavelength dimension such that at every pixel, every X and Y, we have a spectrum. The first key step in this conversion is of course convolving the simulated galaxy with a point spread function of a given size. This is essentially what decides the spatial resolution of the output image, right? Here's an example of two synthetic H-alpha maps, um, so hydrogen alpha maps. The left one is at a very high spatial resolution, a fine spatial resolution, or small size of PSF, whichever way you look at it. And the right one is a coarse spatial resolution. And obviously we see the, left, uh, the image on the right is much more smeared out, as expected. The other key step is to add noise to our synthetic data cubes, right? In order to make them more realistic. Here's an example of two synthetic data cubes at the same spatial resolution, but different levels of noise. The left one does not have any noise, whereas the right one does. And obviously, you know, it moves, looks more messy, but also more realistic. So once we have this spatially smeared, noisy mock data cube, we fit a spectrum along every, you know, along each pixel, which gives us spatial maps of different emission lines. From these emission line maps, we derive the metallicity, of metallicity map, and therefore from the metallicity map, we can derive the metallicity gradient by fitting a linear profile. In summary, the whole idea is that because we have complete control over our simulation, we have complete control on the input or the true metallicity gradient, we go ahead and produce a, a range of mock data cubes for different values of uh, spatial resolution, different values of noise, um, and then we compare how much is the inferred metallicity gradient of the mock data cube how similar or different it is to the actual original gradient uh, as a function of the noise and the spatial resolution. So here's a test case, right? So we have here we have metallicity as a function of distance from the center. The gray points in the background are the individual pixels. Blue points are the binned data, binned data. The red line shows the true metallicity gradient, what the galaxy actually has. The blue line, which is fitted on the blue, blue data points, it denotes, denotes the gradient that we recover from this uh, mock data cube. Um, and in the inset, we see the 2D distribution of metal. Well, in this particular case, we have a pretty fine resolution and pretty high signal to noise ratio. Therefore, the red and the blue lines match almost um, on top of each other, which is why what we would expect. If I reduce the signal to noise ratio, however, therefore we see more noise and more scatter in the data in this uh, plot on the right. 
but also the recovered um, gradient, the blue line, is still not very far from the red line, which is good. But if we now reduce both the signal to noise ratio as well as the as well as make the spatial resolution worse, which is you know on the bottom right panel, we see that the metallicity is being systematically overestimated towards the outskirts of the galaxy, which means if I'm trying to fit a straight line, now my blue line is much flatter than the red line. So in a sense, it's the same galaxy, but you, know, you can imagine that it's being observed by different instruments of different qualities, and we're getting different answers uh, for the same given you know, true answer. Um, interestingly, we also find uh, similar trends in large IFU surveys as well, in the sense that we see flattening of the metallicity profile towards outskirts. Um, this can at least partially be uh, explained by the PSF smearing, as I just demonstrated, uh, without involving or without the need to invoke large-scale dynamics. Right? Okay, so now we have now we have uh, not one but a bunch of you know mock data cubes at different levels of spatial resolution and different levels of noise. Now let's just put all of them together in a plot and try to learn something about this or try to quantify this behavior. What I have here is on the y-axis we have the amount of incorrectness or the inaccuracy in the measured gradient uh, as a function of the spatial resolution on the x-axis, whereas the resolution is measured in the units of number of PSFs that can fit into the scale radius of the galaxy. On this plot, essentially it means that if you're moving towards the right, you are going towards better or finer spatial resolution. If you're moving towards left, you are going towards poorer or coarser spatial resolution. Um, if you are above the dashed line, then your measured gradient is steeper than the actual true gradient. If you are below the dashed line, then you are inferring a shallower than the true gradient. So this is how the parameter space looks like. The different colors indicate mock data cubes of different signal to noise levels. Um, the blue ones being the worst signal to noise, yellow ones being the best signal to noise. The immediate trend that jumps out is that the data cubes with poorer resolution towards the left of the plot and poorer signal to noise, they tend to be more and more, they tend to be farther and farther away from that you know, dashed line, which means they are, they are more and more shallow. The gradients are more and more shallow compared to the intrinsic gradient. This is what we get if we include all the pixels in the gradient fitting, like there's no exclusion of any pixels, no signal to noise cutoff. However, if we do discard all the pixels below a certain signal to noise levels, for example, let's say five, we get a much better behaved or much more smoothly behaved trend as a function of resolution, which is what we see on the right here, right? While the trend with the signal to noise ratio almost disappears, the second obvious um, sort of uh, feature that jumps out is that there is a certain spatial resolution beyond which the accuracy of the observation does not increase any further, but below which we see a steady decrease in the accuracy. In this case, it happens to be around um, uh, you know, a resolution of five beams per scale radius. So if you have more than five beams per scale radius, your observations are, are pretty much as, as best as they can be, right? But below that, you might have to worry about you know, not being able to recover the intrinsic metallicity very accurately. So now that we have uh, used, uh, we've used to, um, this data, this models to fit a functional form, which is the black dashed curve here. And um, we, we use that to correct existing metallicity gradient observations. Oh, look at that, we are halfway through the top, awesome. Um, now, that we, now that you've made it uh, to almost halfway through, I think you deserve, for no reason at all, um, a glimpse of the Australian night sky. These were a couple of photographs taken by me during camping in on the southeastern coast of Australia. All right, back after the completely unnecessary break. Um, so as I was saying, we now have we now know that uh, with shallower, with poorer, uh, coarser spatial resolution, we have shallower metallicity gradients. Now we can use that information to actually correct the existing metallicity gradient, ob gradient observations. Right. So we have. Um, in order to derive these corrections, we generate even more data cubes with different values of intrinsic gradient, and then we interpolate between all of our synthetic data cubes, right? For example, here is a test case. Um, here on the y-axis, we have the uh, measured metallicity gradient. On the x-axis, we have the true or the intrinsic gradient. Different colors in this case denote different levels of spatial resolution, right? Everything we if everything were reproduced perfectly, then every, all the data points would lie exactly on the diagonal one-to-one -one line, the dashed line. 
which of course it doesn't. And that's because as we have seen already that the black points, which in this case is the coarsest resolution, are farthest or the shallowest compared to the input um, gradient. So we essentially in interpolate between these models to determine the offset as a smooth function of the spatial resolution. And we use that offset to sort of correct for these, um, for these measurements. Once we apply the correction, here is how it looks, right? So here on the y-axis, we are showing the corrected gradient based on this interpolation. And now we see, as expected, the test sort of works. Uh, most of our data models now lie on the one-to-one -one line. Now let's just go ahead and quickly apply these to actual observed IFU data cubes. For that, uh, we choose uh, a few of the large existing IFU surveys. In this case, uh, I have chosen the data from the Manga survey to see what effect this correction that we came up with has on the global relations, such as the mass metallicity gradient relation, right? In this case, we are showing the metallicity gradient on the y-axis as a function of stellar mass of the galaxies. The, um, obviously, I haven't uh, shown you the individual data points, but the bind relations are shown, the observed bind or average relation is shown by the red curve there. If we do the correction, if we correct the metallicity gradient um, according to the prescription that I just mentioned, we get the dashed blue curve, right? Um, now, obviously, we see that there's not much of, a, of an overall correction, or the correction doesn't really affect the overall um, global relation with, for the manga galaxies. Now, this is not to say that the correction doesn't affect the manga gradients, or the, the, the metallicity gradients of these galaxies at all, because as we will see in this plot on the right, here we have, uh, here basically we've shown each panel has a histogram of measured gradients in red and then corrected gradients in, in orange. Each panel shows a different bin of spatial resolution, the worst resolution being on the top bin, the best resolution being, being the bottom bin. Now, as expected, the manga galaxies with already very good spatial resolution, which is the bottom panel, they do not show any difference in the histogram even after the correction. Whereas in the top panel, the galaxies with poor resolution they indeed do undergo significant corrections because as we see, there is a difference between the red and the orange histograms, which means that after correction, which is the orange histogram, there are fewer galaxies with you know, gradients close to zero and more galaxies on the wings, which is the steeper gradients, right? So this shows that there are, there are galaxies which do undergo um, corrections, uh, significant corrections individually, but the overall relation, the average relation does not significantly change upon um, using these corrections. Now, just really quickly, the same thing, we see the same qualitative trend with the other IFU surveys, SAMI or Khalifa on the middle panel, and even if we combine all the three surveys, right? Now, it is kind of reassuring uh, in a way that even though individual galaxies do undergo significant corrections in their gradient, the overall average global relation remains mostly unaffected. Now, Quite quickly, um, there are a couple of caveats to this work, obviously. Uh, the first being the lack of modeling of diffused ionized gas in our work. And as some of the existing works, uh, including this work from Puerto Joyo et al, um, has shown that you know, including the diffused ionized gas um, is important for metallicity gradient studies, especially if you have insufficient spatial resolution. The other caveat is obviously the, our entire pipeline is based on a single simulated disk galaxy. Therefore, we have not yet been able to account for potential effects due to different galaxy morphologies, different star formation histories, and so on, right? Um, in other words, because all the galaxies, all galaxies ever are not the same as one single isolated disk galaxy, it is a better idea to produce mock data cubes from cosmological zoom-in simulations rather than isolated um, simulations. That brings me to um, the foggy simulations, which is, which is the team I'm currently a part of here at Johns Hopkins and Space Telescope. The foggy simulations um, uh, are very high resolution cosmological zoom-in simulations. The unique feature of the simulations is the, the order of 100 per parsec resolution, not just in the disk or the ISM of the galaxy, but also in the circumgalactic medium, thanks to the forced refinement technique. Such high resolution in the disk plus CGM is not only useful for producing mock data cubes from a diverse uh, population of galaxies, but it also is important to study the mixing and exchange of metals at the disk CGM interface, which is something that I'm currently working on. You can also check out more videos at the Foggy website, which also has a link to the Foggy YouTube channel. Um, so I'll just quickly um, 
briefly show you or give you a sneak peek of the current state of analysis uh, with the foggy galaxies, um, because the analysis isn't complete yet. Uh, but I do have some preliminary uh, sort of, I guess, figures to show you based on the mock data cubes. Now here's a zoomed in density projection of one of the foggy galaxies. Uh, we currently have six halos. Um, so this is obviously a simulated galaxy. Now we we put this simulated galaxy through the whole machinery that I just described for the previous project um, to churn out mock uh, IFU data cubes. Then some of the data products look like this. Here, for instance, I'm showing the mock data cube, the H alpha flux and the H alpha um, velocity map derived from the mock data cube at a certain very high resolution, in this case 60 parsec, um, at a very high spatial as well as very high spectral resolution without any noise. Right? Just another example of the same galaxy at a later time. Um, if we zoom in in around you know, uh, 12 kiloparsec uh, field of view aside. Five minutes. Oh, thank you. Um, then, then we have, uh, and then we, if we do the same exercise again, let's let's see. So this is the, how the H alpha flux now looks like. Now the, I should mention that these are both the sort of um, images are the same field of view, but the one in the middle looks much different is because the H alpha flux is only from the young star particles, right? The young st uh, stars, and this is at a very high resolution, so 40 parsec resolution, and also as a high spectral resolution. If we smear it out, if we make a more realistic data cube out of the same simulation, then it would look like this, for example. This is a broader or larger PSF size and also a, a smaller value of spectral resolution. So we clearly see that spatial smearing produces a remarkable effect on you know, how we would observe the emission line maps and therefore our inferred properties like metallicity and so on. Right, so this, as I say, this work is currently ongoing. I don't really have science results for this work, but I will quickly show you the metallicity profiles of a, of a particular of this foggy galaxy. Um, so here, what we see is metallicity as a function of galactic, galactocentric distance. In this particular case, it is color coded by the radial velocity of the gas. Right, red being outward moving stuff, and blue being stuff that's moving towards the center of the galaxy. Um, the second panel is the same thing. It's also, again, a metallicity profile, but it's differently color-coded. It's color-coded with density now, with yellow and orange being the really, really dense parts. And then lastly, this is a temperature color-coded with pink, purple being the cool uh, or cold uh, gas, and the yellow being the hot gas. Um, the idea is that, so this is a movie, and I'm going to play this movie in a minute. The idea is that we should be able to see, at least qualitatively, how the cold metal poor gas flows inwards, so basically from the bottom of the bottom of these figures, and then it gets enriched by star formation, so basically moves upwards, uh, basically moves upwards along the plot, and then it will flow out as hot, diffuse, metal-rich gas. Um, at later redshifts, we can even see the inner cold disk, uh, the inner cold dense disk of the galaxy. Uh, as well as we can see a very steep decline in the metallicity profile of the disk. So I'll just give, uh, maybe I have a couple of minutes left, and this is, I'm, I only am left with the summary slides, so I'll give it a minute for this video to play. I don't think I can control the video anyway. Um, oh, also I should have mentioned the, the circles of the dots, the points plotted here are, the, are where the young star formation, are, are where recent star formation is taking place, right? So they are the, they are the gas cells where we have young stars, color coded in the same um, corresponding way. So if you have any question about the metallicity profile about, of the foggy galaxies, or if you have ideas uh, of how, you know, uh, what we could do with this, uh, you're very welcome um, to talk to me. Uh, I am currently working on metallicity gradient of the foggy galaxies, and I'll hopefully be able to show that in a future talk at some point. All right, so moving on to the summary, to wrap it up. Uh, let me just draw your attention back to the big picture. We had set out to study the cosmic noon and tackle the challenges of the galaxies being really, really far away. Uh, we have talked about one of the challenges today. We haven't talked about UV diagnostics. We only talked about how, we, how can we mitigate the limitation of spatial resolution. And so here are the key takeaway points uh, from, from this talk that I would like um, you to um, take home. Uh, first being that insufficient spatial resolution can really lead to artificial flattening of the observed metallicity gradients. And the best possible spatial resolution is sort of four to five beams per galaxy scale length. Um, individual galaxies uh, we can, be, can be corrected. The gradients of individual galaxies can be corrected. 
uh, by using our prescription. And this correction does not have an appreciable effect over the average global relations, such as the mass metallicity gradient, gradient relation. Uh, but however, it is important to use mock data cubes from cosmological zoom-in simulations um, in order to account for the diverse star formation history and diverse mor morphology um, in order to correct for, in order to be able to correct for this effect for a diverse um, sort of sample of galaxies. And that is all from me. Thank you for listening. I'll be happy to take any questions now. Uh, thank you so much, Ayan. So um, okay. if you want to ask questions, raise your hand. If you go to uh, the people in the side um, bar in people, you have the raise hand um, button on the, on the bottom. So, or you can write the, the questions in the chat and I can read them from, from. So I have a question for you, Ian. Um, so you showed at the, at the beginning that there's this flattening at, you know, like a large radius of the, of the metallicity profile. How um, accurate is that? So how, how reliable is that flattening that we see? Because that has implications on how we regard the, you know, like the, the, the evolution of, of galaxies, right? How they build up. Yep, absolutely. That's a, that's a great question. So the short answer is it is the flattening, depending on how, uh, what's the spatial resolution of your observation, um, it can be at least partially contributed to by these artificial flattening effect due to, you know, limited spatial resolution. We do see even in Milky Way studies, which obviously do not suffer from resolution issues, that there does tend to be slightly, um, you know, flattening or upturn of the metallicity profile towards the outskirts. So my answer would be it is a combination of both. Uh, it's a combination of something probably real that's happening, maybe a galactic fountain model, where, where the galaxy is sort of accreting metal rich cats on the outskirts, um, as well as, you know, if your, resolu if your resolution is um, coarse enough, then you're also, in addition to that real effect, you're also probably seeing an artificial flattening um, just due to the insufficient spatial resolution. Great. I don't have to change those. So that's good. Any other questions from the audience? Don't be, don't be shy. Ian is very nice, so you can ask him questions. Um, or you can ask me questions later. I am, I am in Bloomberg 107. I keep coming to Muller Building from time to time. Okay. Well, if there are no questions so far, uh, we will thank our speaker again. Uh, thank you very much. And we will move on to uh, our uh, next speaker. So our uh, next speaker today is uh, Marjorie Declare. Uh, Marjorie obtained her PhD at Ghent University in Belgium. And since uh, the end of 2019, she's a postdoc uh, at the Space Telescope Science Institute um, uh, as part of, of the ISM STAR group, and mainly works on interstellar dust. Today, she's going to talk about the dust properties of our own Milky Way. So, Marjorie, all yours. Yes. Um, I'll try to share the screen again. I guess that works. Okay. Sure. So, hello everyone. Uh, as Mireya just said, my name is Marjorie Declare and I'm a postdoc at the Space Telescope Science Institute working in the ISM STAR group. And I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk in these great seminar series. Um, so today I want to share with you some of the research I've been doing over the past few years related to interstellar dust properties in the Milky Way. And I would like to start my talk actually with the end or with the main conclusions I would like you to take away from this. And those are twofold. First, um, dust extinction is not uniform across the Milky Way. And second, the average near infrared Milky Way extinction curve can be represented by a Powell law. Now, I will explain how I got to these conclusions, but since many of you might not be very familiar with this topic, I will start with a brief introduction on dust and dust extinction before explaining uh, the methods and the results of my work. So 
we know that the interstellar dust only makes up a very small fraction of the mass of the interstellar medium in galaxies. Typically about 1% of the interstellar matter is dust. So, of course, you can ask yourself the question, why do we care, right? Why should we care about this dust? Well, the dust is actually a very crucial component in galaxies because it influences processes that happen inside the galaxy. For example, the dust particles can regulate the temperature of the interstellar gas through collisions with the gas particles. And they also help in the formation of molecular hydrogen, which will form more easily on the surface of a dust grain than in a diffuse ISM. And once these molecules are formed, the dust will shield them from the stellar radiation, pretty much as a parasol shields us from the sun. So these three elements combined create an environment in which stars can be formed in the molecular clouds. So dust is really important for star formation. And uh, the dust is also a reservoir of metals, which are the main building blocks of uh, planets, and in fact, for all organic material that we know today, including ourselves. So yeah, we're actually all made out of stardust. Now, apart from all this, um, the dust also has a big impact on the starlight because it absorbs and scatters a large fraction of the stellar radiation. And the combination of absorption and scattering is called extinction. So this mainly happens at UV and optical wavelengths, but also in the near and mid infrared. Now, before I continue, I would like to emphasize the difference between extinction and attenuation, because these terms are often confused, but they are actually different things. We speak of extinction if the light is coming from a point source, like a star, and all the dust is located between the star and the observer. And this is true for stars in the Milky Way, but also, for example, for the Magellanic Clouds, because we can see individual stars. However, for galaxies further away, we cannot resolve individual stars. And thus, when we look in a certain direction, there will always be a mix of stars and dust in our observation beam. The effect of the dust is then called attenuation, and there are two radiative transfer effects that need to be considered in this case. One is the fact that dust can also scatter light into the line of sight, in addition to scattering out of the line of sight. And the other one is that some stars will be extinguished more than others, depending on uh, their depth in the dust cloud. And so your flux weighted measurements in the beam will be dominated by the stars that are less extinguished. So a measurement of the attenuation will depend on both the intrinsic dust properties and the underlying geometry between the stars and dust in the galaxy. While for extinction, that only depends on the dust properties. So my entire PhD thesis was about uh, measuring dust attenuation in nearby galaxies. Um, so if you're interested in that, you can always ask me later or you can check out my paper from 2019. But in this talk, I will focus on dust extinction in the Milky Way. So we can quantify this with an extinction curve, which gives you the amount of extinction as a function of wavelength. And this is, for example, an average curve for the Milky Way. And it is clear that extinction is very wavelength dependent. It's very high at short wavelengths, and then it drops as we go to longer wavelengths. And this is interesting because from absorption and scattering theory, we know that smaller grains are more effective at absorbing light at shorter wavelengths, while the larger grains are more efficient at longer wavelengths. So different wavelength regions contain information about different sizes of the dust grains. And the overall slope of the extinction curve can reveal the distribution of the dust grain sizes. But we can also observe features in the extinction curves. For example, there's a strong bump feature at 2175 angstrom. And uh, features like these are really interesting because we can compare them with results from laboratory experiments and um, with that information, we can learn about the composition of the dust grains. For example, it is believed that this UV bump originates from some type of carbonaceous grains. Now, there's still some debate going on about the exact composition, but we're pretty sure it's carbon. 
And then at 10 and 20 micron, we see clear features caused by silicates. So extinction curves are very useful, not only to account for dust extinction in all kinds of observations, but also to learn more about the properties of the dust itself, which is actually my main motivation to study them. Now, how do we uh, measure an extinction curve? Well, one way to do it is by using the so-called pair method, in which we um, observe a star reddened by a dust cloud in the line of sight, and we compare its spectrum to that of a comparison star of the same spectral type that has not been reddened by any dust. And so the difference between both spectra is then due to the dust extinction. And that is how we obtain an extinction curve like this one. And there have been a bunch of studies which measured uh, extinction in the UV and in optical. Um, and I listed a number of them here. And especially the first one from Cardelli et al, 1989, is quite famous and is still very often used as the standard Milky Way extinction curve. But there have been way fewer studies at longer wavelengths. Now, last year, Carl Gordon published a paper on the mid-infrared uh, Milky Way extinction curve, where he also studied the silicate features. And so my recent work is sort of complementary to that paper and to the other studies, as I'm targeting the near-infrared, so from around 0.8 micron to 5-ish micron. So everything that follows now is uh, published in my recent paper, which appeared on the archive yesterday, and uh, was published in AppJ last Thursday. So I can put a link in the chat after my talk uh, in case you want to have a look. So some studies have looked at the near infrared, but those were all based on two mass or other GHK photometry, so only a handful of data points. And to improve on this, um, we used spectra from SPECS. SPECS is a medium resolution spectrograph at the NASA Infrared Telescope Facility on Mauna Kea. And SPECS can take spectra from about 0.8 to 5.5 micron. And as you can see, this nicely bridges the gap between UV and optical and mid-infrared spectra. On the left, I show uh, the spectra of our sample of reddened stars. And on the right, I show the spectra of the comparison stars. And as I explained before, we then have to match every reddened star to a comparison star based on their spectral type in order to cancel out the hydrogen absorption lines in their spectrum. And by dividing each pair, we then find these 15 extinction curves. Now, one thing you can do with a sample of extinction curves is to calculate the average. So that's what I did. Um, and this is the average measured uh, extinction curve. So, as you can see, it looks a lot like a power law. So I fitted the measured curve with a power law and the red line shows the result. So yes, it looks like a power law works pretty well. And when comparing uh, to other results from the literature, we find a pretty good agreement between the different curves, even though the sample was different for all these studies. So we actually don't expect the curves to be exactly the same. And again, keep in mind that these other studies were all based on a few photometric data points only, whereas we use uh, the full spectra. Now, an average curve is very useful, for example, to account for extinction in your uh, near-infrared observations. But from the sample, it is clear that the extinction is not the same for all sight lines. So I also fitted a power law to the individual extinction curves, so with an amplitude S and a power law index alpha. And on the right, I'm showing all the power law fits uh, on top of each other, just to give you an idea about the variety of extinction curves in our sample. So we really find a range in amplitudes and power law indices. And it would be interesting if these variations are maybe linked to other dust properties. For example, to RV. Now, RV is the total to selective extinction, and it is measured as the ratio between the extinction in the V-band and the differential extinction between B and V-band. So it's in fact an optical measurement. And we also know that RV is actually a tracer of the size distribution of the dust grains. Now, I won't go into too much detail here, but in short, if RV is higher, we see that the curve is somewhat flatter, 
And this corresponds to having a larger average dust grain size. And as a reference, the average Milky Way value is about 3.1. Now for a better explanation about the link between RV and dust grain size, I encourage you to watch the talk by Dries van der Putte, which was recorded on March 15th. But for now, the interesting thing here is that the shape of the near infrared extinction curve seems to depend on this quantity RV. Well, this dependence uh, on RV is actually something that has been found in the past. For example, back in 1989, Cardelli et al. found that in the optical and the UV, most of the variation in extinction between the different sightlines in their sample could be explained by this one parameter RV. And based on broadband photometry, they found a linear relationship between extinction and RV. So this relationship is still known today as the RV-dependent extinction. And more recently, Fitzpatrick et al. confirmed this relationship based on spectral measurements in the UV and optical. So now the question is, is this also the case for the near-infrared? And to check this, I plotted the extinction as a function of RV, or in fact, 1 over RV in this case, at a handful of wavelengths in the near-infrared. And indeed, at all these wavelengths, we see a linear trend. So this confirms that also the near-infrared extinction is dependent on RV. And if you then fit this linear relationship between extinction and 1 over RV at every wavelength in the near-infrared, you get a value for the intercept and the slope of this linear equation at every wavelength, which is then shown on the right. And with that information, we can now approximate the average near-infrared extinction curve for different values of RV from the above equation. So in other words, if the RV is known from optical measurements for a certain sightline in the Milky Way, we can now predict how the near-infrared extinction curve looks like without having any data in the near-infrared. So that's pretty cool because with this you can now account for dust extinction in all of your near-infrared observations if you have an estimate of RV for your line of sight. And if you don't know RV, you can always use the average RV of 3.1. Okay, so I showed this plot before and I explained that features in the extinction curve can tell us about the dust grain composition. So now the question is, are there any features in the near-infrared region? Well, looking carefully at our individual extinction curves, we observed features for only two sightlines in our sample, around three micron. And if you zoom in on that wavelength region, uh, you indeed see some structure there. Now, from the literature and from laboratory experiments, we know that water ice has a strong absorption feature at three micron. So this is most likely what we see here. But for water ice to survive in the ISM, we believe that you need a somewhat denser environment so that there is enough shielding from the stellar radiation. Because otherwise it would be too hot and the ice would sim sublimate. So we see this feature in two of our sightlines and these are just considered dense sightlines as opposed to the rest of the sample, which are then the diffuse sightlines. And so when I was talking about the average extinction curve before, I actually meant the diffuse average extinction curve. Okay, so we tried to fit this feature by adding a modified Drude profile to the Powell law, because Drude profiles are generally used to fit features of solid materials. And the result is shown in red. Um, but then you look at it again and you go like, eh, there's maybe something else there. Right? There seems to be another bump around 3.4 micron. And again, from the literature and from laboratory studies, um, it's likely that this is caused by hydrogenated amorphous carbon, or HAC for short. And then I've tried to fit both features with different profiles, but that didn't work very well. So in the end, we decided to just stick with a, a profile, one profile for the main feature. But yeah, when you look at the residuals, the fit is definitely not perfect. We are probably masking the hack feature, and it is also possible that we didn't get the continuum quite right. And the main issue here is that these wavelengths suffer quite a bit from absorption by the Earth's atmosphere. 
when you look at a typical atmospheric transmission model, you see that the transmission around 3 micron is very unstable, which causes the noise in the extinction curve around the feature. And yeah, as soon as you go beyond 4 micron, it's basically hopeless. So it's really difficult to get decent constraints on both the continuum extinction and the shape of the features. As a final step, I then went back to the diffuse average extinction curve to see if there might be any features or any signatures of the ice feature or maybe the hack feature or who knows any new features. And the best way to do this is to look at the residuals between the data and the power law fit. And I split the data up into five chunks and in every wavelength region, I measured the standard deviation of the residuals around zero just to get an idea of the noise level in every region. So that's what the magenta dashed lines represent. So basically, if you see anything outside of those lines, those could be actual features. However, there are a few things that we need to consider here. Um, first of all, because we are matching reddened stars to comparison stars, it is possible that this match is not perfect and that there still are some hydrogen lines in the extinction curves that have not been cancelled out. And so that's indeed what we see here, for example, below one micron or just below one and a half micron. These are signatures of the passion and bracket jumps. And in fact, all the vertical blue lines also indicate strong hydrogen lines. And indeed, you see some outlying data points on those lines. So this is due to small mismatches between the reddened and the comparison stars. And then, okay, you might see something there, maybe, or here. But again, I'm very suspicious about these regions um, because, yeah, I plot again the atmospheric transmission on top. And I think we are just suffering from telluric absorption in those regions. So that's annoying. And well, you can probably guess where I'm going with this because wouldn't it be great if we could get spectra in the near infrared from space? Well, that's exactly what the James Webb Sta Space Telescope will do. Um, so IMPI of a cycle one program to observe nine reddened stars in the Milky Way with uh, NIRCAM and MIRI. And these observation, observations will cover the near and mid infrared. So we will be able to study the silicate features at 10 and 20 micron, but also the weaker feature at 3.4 micron, which I mentioned just before. However, with the resolution of NIRCAM and MIRI, we cannot just detect these features, but we can actually measure the central wavelength, the strength and the width of these features. And we can then compare those to measurements from the laboratory to find out what type of silicates and what type of carbons we are dealing with. For example, do we see pyroxenes or olivines or uh, do we detect aromatic or aliph aliphatic hydrocarbons and so on. And who knows, maybe we will discover any new features in this wavelength region. But apart from the features, we will also get a really good measurement of the near and mid infrared continuum extinction, uh, all the way from 2.4 to 28 micron. And this will give us information about the sizes of the dust grains, as I explained in the beginning. So from the JWST data, we will learn a lot about the dust properties along these nine sight lines. Now, you might be wondering why nine? Yes, thank you. Why nine and why these specific sight lines? Well, of course, we are not just going to observe a random sample of sight lines. No, we picked our sample very carefully and we chose nine sight lines for which we already have other measurements. For example, we have UV extinction curves for these sight lines from IUE spectra. And we can then look for correlations between the strength of the UV bump and the properties of the HEC feature, because both are believed to be carbonaceous in nature, and we can figure out if they maybe have the same carrier. And comparing the strength of the carbonaceous features to those to that of the silicate features will um, put constraints on the relative contribution of carbons versus silicates in the interstellar dust. But there's more. Um, we also have molecular hydrogen fractions from fused spectra. And since we know that molecular hydrogen can only survive in regions where it is shielded from the stellar radiation, think about the parasol, 
the fraction of molecular hydrogen is actually a good tracer for the cloud density along the line of sight, and so the environment in which the dust resides. And finally, we will also observe these same sight lines with Hubble, uh, with this. And from absorption lines in the UV spectra, we can then measure the abundances of the elements that make up the dust. For example, here shown for magnesium, but also for carbon, silicon, iron, and oxygen. So in other words, this will give us the actual uh, number of these atoms locked up in the dust along a given sight line. And with that, we can figure out, for example, the ratio between silicon and oxygen, which again reveals the precise composition of the dust grains. And then we can also check how the abundances correlate to the features in the extinction curves. So the combination of all these measurements will put very strong constraints on the dust properties in the Milky Way, and also how they vary with environment. Now, maybe you are wondering, why nobody has done this before, because there have been several studies in the past on the dust extinction features in near and mid-infrared, and there have been depletion studies, so why have we never tried to compare those? Well, the main issue here is actually the sample. Um, near and mid-infrared extinction is usually measured in sight lines with large amounts of dust, because that gives you stronger extinction features. However, if there's so much dust in your sight line, the extinction in the UV would be so high that we simply don't detect the star anymore, for example, with HST. So we cannot measure abundances. So our target sight lines have less material along the line of sight so that we can still detect them in the UV. But this, of course, makes the extinction features in the infrared much weaker. And that is exactly why we need the very high sensitivity of JWST to be able to measure those weak features. So this is basically why it has not been done before. And to conclude, as I said earlier, uh, the combination of all these measurements will put very strong constraints on the dust grain compositions in the Milky Way. And since we will have all this information for the same sample of sight lines, we will be comparing apples to apples. So basically, the JWST data is the last missing piece of the puzzle, and I'm really looking forward to see how the observations from all these different telescopes together will help us to better understand the interstellar dust in our galaxy. And with that, I'm back at the takeaway messages from the beginning, although I added a few things, just in case you're still awake. So I hope I convinced you that dust extinction is not uniform the cross, across the Milky Way, but it depends on this quantity RV. We found that the average near-infrared Milky Way extinction curve can be represented by a power law. Unfortunately, the telluric absorption complicates things, such as fitting the features. But soon, very soon, uh, JWST will come to the rescue and we will get some really cool results. So thanks for listening and I'm ready to take any questions. Thank you so much, Marjorie. It was an amazing talk. Um, do we have any questions from Martin? Well, if not, um, I have one. So you mentioned that you're um, going to observe nine um, line of sights. Uh, are you? Uh, do you want to uh, increase those line of sights, or, or with that, are those are the most representative and, and therefore, you know, like the most interesting and the, the ones that are going to provide the most information? Yeah. So, um, so the reason why we have those nine is, um, as I said, because we have all those other measurements, and those are really the only nine sight lines in the Milky Way for which we have all those measurements. So that that really limits our sample. Of course, if we want to um, extend this we would need to observe. Um, so if we want to extend this to more sight lines as possible, but then we would need more JWST data, more HST data, and then we would also need the UV um, extinction curves. And so some, there are more sight lines that have UV extinction curves, but um, not all of them. So we would need a lot more observations to have all the combination of all the um, observations. So for now, this is the only sample for which we can do it. I am.
Yep, uh, that was a great talk, Marjorie. Um, my question is uh, relating to your, I think, first conclusion where you, you've convinced us that the extinction is not the same everywhere in Milky Way, it depends on the sight lines. So if it's this different in the Milky Way itself, I can imagine it's going to be different in other galaxies as well, but those galaxies are obviously farther away and we can't even see individual stars. So my question is, what hope do we have in trying to get spatially dependent extinction laws um, for extragalactic studies? And if we don't, or until we don't, how much is that actually affecting our science results for other galaxies? Yeah, that, that's an excellent question. So um, at this point, we can have extinction curves, so resolved extinction curves for um, the Magellanic Clouds, and we are working on M31 and M33, um, but there is a limit to like how far we can go, even with the best telescope in the world, world even if we can resolve individual stars, um, there, there will be other issues um, that, that we need to take into account. So at some point, you can no longer measure extinction curves. You really have to go to attenuation. And then you have the other issues that I explained, uh, because you can have uh, scattering into the line of sight, or you might have, um, um, yeah, you might have the differential extinction between stars that are at different depths. Um, so measuring those attenuation curves is not easy, and understanding them is, is even more difficult because you have different effects. And so for now, I'm focusing on, on the extinction because, um, in my opinion, if we have not even figured out the properties of the dust in our own Milky Way, then I don't understand how we're going to, like, um, try to, uh, to understand them in other galaxies. But it is really a, a difficult question as to how, how, um, how much influence it has on other galaxies. Um, but definitely, as I found in my thesis, um, also the attenuation is not uniform at all. It's very different for different galaxies. Thanks. So we have a question in the chat. Um, can any of, this, of these same observations be done on the circumstellar clouds of protostellar systems to deter determine dust compositions? Um, that's a very good question, and that's something I've not thought about. So um, I guess you could do um, some observations, although we always need uh, a background star, and then we observe the, the absorption along the line of sight. So as long as you have that, I think it should be, should be possible. Uh, another question from, from Daniel Walty. Um, most of the sidelines will have a number of velocity components, potentially with different properties. How will this affect the conclusions that can be drawn? Uh, yes, yeah, so we are not um, we are not looking at, at the or we're not trying to look at the different components separately. Um, we are mostly probing the local ISM in the sense that all the stars that I'm looking at are like within um, within three um, kiloparsecs. So um, if you look at stars that, for example, are in the galactic center, we already see that those have different uh, dust properties. And that's probably because we have different components along the line of sight, and there might be some dense material mixed with diffuse material. Um, so my sight lines are diffuse and are all relatively nearby. So there might be different components, but we expect that they have similar properties. Thank you very much, uh, Marjorie. Um, so we are on the top of the hour, so if there are no more questions, uh, please feel free to reach Marjorie and Ian for you know, more questions, um, more discussions. Uh, let's thank our speakers again, and see you soon in, the, in, our, in two weeks, more or less, for our next uh, Discovery Seminar Talks. Thank you very much. We'll see thank you. Everyone. Thank you. See ya.